Welcome to Wanna Be, the podcast that takes you from where you are now to where you want to be in 30 minutes or less. I'm Imriel Morgan, founder of Content is Queen, a podcast community that specializes in empowering and amplifying underrepresented voices, specifically women, people of color, and LGBTQIA people. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Wannabe's focus is to help you take consistent action to build a successful life and career in the creative and entertainment industry. Today's guest is Zeba Blay. Zeba is a film and culture critic whose writing has been featured in the New York Times, Essence, Film Quarterly and The Village Voice to name a few. Zeba has spent nearly a decade long career writing about pop culture at the intersection of race, gender and identity. being one of the first people to coin the term hashtag carefree black girls on Twitter in 2013 to create a space to celebrate black womanhood online. She is now the author of a book by the same name. In today's interview, Zeba and I talk about the challenges of finding your voice as a writer, and we explore what it might mean if you don't find your voice. We talk about working through your fears and getting comfortable and uncomfortable with therapy. We also talk about what it means to be a carefree black girl. Let's get into it. Who did you want to be before you became who you are today and why? I'm not really sure. I was always afraid when I was younger that I was just going to grow up and be really messy and not have my life together. Mm -hmm. So the thing I wanted most was just to be a person who had their life together, who had a career, who could pay their bills, who could be responsible because I felt so messy when I was younger. And the gag is now I'm still messy. (laughs) So (laughs) who I am now is not quite what I was expecting, but I'm okay with it. (laughs) I'm glad. I think sometimes just to accept the things that you cannot change about yourself. But what about the other stuff that you felt were a marker of not only adulthood, but I guess like some extension being a successful adult, like paying your bills, looking after yourself, all that good stuff. Have you achieved that bit now? I guess I have in certain ways in certain ways I haven't I mean I have a career as a writer I have a book coming out but money is still tight (laughs) you know and there's always more that I'm trying to achieve but I also think that my conception of success in general has shifted a lot and I think I'm less interested in acquiring And I'm less interested in achieving for the sake of myself. Anything that I do has to be bigger about more than just me and my ego. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's really important, actually. But I also appreciate that you said that because I think often we glamorize writers Mm -hmm. and think, oh, gosh, your name's everywhere. You're able to write these big, impactful things that can shape culture, but also can really help people see themselves in your words, right? There's like so much power in the pen, so to speak, or in the keyboard now. I don't want to say it's nice to know, but it's good to know that actually there's still some challenges and obstacles that make it a little bit more difficult and that actually it's not all the glitz, the glam and the followers and the and the likes and mm-hmm. everything else. There's some stuff behind that. I would love to know how you found your voice because you've not written a book, which we'll definitely get into because it's got the most fantastic title but I would love to know how you went about developing and finding your voice and how did you feel confident in sharing that with the world as well I think I'm constantly in the process of finding my voice I think my journey as a writer has always been about honesty and getting closer and closer to a place where I can be fully honest with myself on the page and so you know when I first started writing I was doing a lot of film and television criticism and it was a very white and male dominated space. And then also when you're in your early twenties, you're just like, what's going on? So (laughs) during that time, I definitely, I think there were parts of myself that I kept hidden and that I didn't want to look at in my writing because I felt like I had to write with some sort of objectivity. And it's funny when I started doing my podcast in 20. 13, 2014 with my friend Fariha. It was called Two Brown Girls. And we talked about pop culture, but we talked about it specifically centering our identities and our experiences as women of color. And that was sort of the moment when I started to understand what it is that I'm interested in. Because I Mm -hmm. feel like when you know what you're interested in, then you find what your voice is. But I think now writing the book was one of the most challenging things I've ever had to do, but also one of the most fruitful I don't if that's weird but like I gained a lot from it 
I understand myself so much more as a writer because I realized for a long time I was writing from a place of pure terror. Oh, really? <laughs> I was writing from a place of such fear. So working on this book, I had to push through the fear. You know, I'm talking about things that are things that I have been ashamed or embarrassed or afraid to vocalize to myself, let alone strangers. And so getting to the point where I felt like I could do that, it was a process, but it was a necessary one because that's the writing that I want to read and that's writing that I want to write. How do you work through fear, though? Are you just feeling it and you're just like, I'm gonna just push through and every keystroke is a challenge? (laughs) (laughs) I really, you know what, you tell me because... (laughs) It's funny that this morning I I had like a moment of prayer where I was like, I am just jumping into the abyss. I don't know what's going to happen, but I think what helps me push through that fear of the unknown is again, going back to this knowledge that it's not about me because Mm -hmm. I think writers are very egotistical people and they're very, you know, and like, I mean, you said it (laughs) and that's real, but I think As writers, like it's then important to be aware of that Mm -hmm. and to constantly challenge that part of yourself because insecurity is just ego. Insecurity is just, oh my God, what are people going to think of me? I'm just in a place where I'm trying to become more and more concerned with what I think about myself and what I think about what is my writing offering to the world that isn't about me and what I can get, right? Because the likes will come the money, whatever it is will come. And those things are not going to make me happy. I already know because I wrote a book and I'm still not happy. So like, you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. So it has to be something else. It has to be about something else. And I think that remembering that, that it has to be about something else, it makes me feel brave. And also it's important to remember that sometimes being brave is not about not being afraid. It's about embracing your fear and understanding that it's a part of being a a person. That's really interesting. I suppose there is a level of honesty that you have to give, or vulnerability, as uh, Brene Brown says. You have to be vulnerable and really pull from yourself to get the most fully formed, most authentic expression that really then sits and resonates with people because people can just tell, (laughs) can't they? You can just sense when someone's not giving or they're not fully free and you can feel that in writing sometimes depending on what the subject matter is and good writing and bad writing because it's not always about the sentence construction and the grammar it's how does this make me feel when I consume it because it's still a form of art I definitely can commend you for going through the process and and actually pulling a book out of that because that just you describing that process sounds absolutely petrifying to me and I cannot (laughs) no part of me is like nah that sounds like something someone else can do I'm I'm good I'm gonna stay here in my cage for now where it feels safe (laughs) (laughs) there will be a time it's just not now (laughs) but I do want to talk about the process of writing and writing a book versus the writing that you do every day as part of your job. Why was that so different? Why did it feel so different? What was the distinction that you were making in your mind? I think part of it is just that, you know, I worked for five years at the Huffington Post. And I think when you are writing for sort of like an entity like that, even though it's your name, it doesn't belong to you. And so like to actually have to write something that has my name on it. It's a collection of my essays. It's just me. And it's being published on paper. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not just like online, you know, Mm. it creates this permanence that I don't think you get with online writing. Online writing can feel so fleeting, even though it really isn't. I mean, if you search my name, you'll find the worst (laughs) things I've ever written (laughs) online from like, you know, like 10 years ago to actually be put in a position where I can write and say and feel anything I want on this page because it's my page. There's such a freedom in that, but there's also fear. Like that's really scary because what if you mess up? What if 
you don't say everything that you want to say. And I think also, especially when you're a Black woman in an industry and a society that privileges white people, there's always this fear of, am I going to get another chance, right? Like, Mm. am I going to, you know, this is my first book. Of course, I have several more books in me, but will this be enough to quote unquote validate me as a writer? And so for me, so much of my writing process was grappling with what validation even means for Mm -hmm. me and grappling with what I think about myself as a writer. I feel like I really met myself. There were so many things I didn't realize I was even feeling until I wrote them. Once you have those realizations about like my childhood and stuff, it's like, okay, validation is nice, but this is like therapy. (laughs) Yes, I was going to say it sounds like therapy, which I am doing. And I'm as you were describing the experience, I was like, yes, that sounds about right because it's like (laughs) peeling back these layers totally I don't know if you experience it this way but you know how like some alcoholic beverages I don't really drink anymore but like Bailey's or something where it Mm -hmm. it tastes so sweet so all you're drinking you're you're just drinking juice and then slowly but surely you go to get up and you're just like whoa and you're twisted you're like whoa yeah (laughs) that's kind of what therapy feels like so was that what it was like a bit like you're peeling back these layers and you're just like hold on a second I've gone deep here what when did that happen what's going on and that's the thing about therapy because I'm also I've been in therapy now consistently for about three or four years and therapy is not fun when we talk about doing the work and all these things doing the work means work it's important work but sometimes it's not fun sometimes it's incredibly unpleasant to look at these shadowy parts of yourself the book is called carefree black girls which I think someone could see that title and expect to get one thing. And actually, as I was writing the book, I was trying to understand what joy and freedom was for me and what it meant for me as a Black woman. And the only way that I could really explore that was by also talking about the other side of joy, which is pain and sadness. And so that's really hard. But I think that it makes for, at least for me, it made for a much more dynamic writing experience. I felt like I was really challenging myself in a way that I'm proud of, even if I don't love everything that I wrote. (laughs) (laughs) I suppose that's the done is better than perfect is the phrase that my favorite writer Mallory Blackman says. She's like, just get it done. You don't have to get it right. You don't have to have it perfect. Just finish the thing because you can spend a lot of time waiting for it to be right. It's an incredible achievement to have written a book. I would love to know, and I'm sure you probably get asked this or will be asked this a bunch, but what does it mean to be a carefree Black girl? I think being a carefree Black girl is whatever you want it to be. I don't think that there's any one archetype or there's any one way to be a carefree Black girl. And I think that is the point. I think that Black women are so complex and there's so many ways to be a person. Mm -hmm. But I I think that Black women are often put into these boxes and given these stereotypes that you can't be happy and sad. You can't be ratchet and bougie. Like you can't be all these different things, but actually you can. Like we contain multitudes. And so for me, a carefree Black girl is someone who embraces every part of themselves and accepts every part of themselves and shows up as that person in the world without fear. It's a big bit there at the end. It's doing that without the fear. That's a hard thing to achieve, no? (laughs) That's the struggle. There's always someone quick and ready with a judgment, a thought, and you have to shirk it off. And that's not always easy to do. But I appreciate what you had to say there because I think that you're right. There are so many expressions and ultimately we are still human. (laughs) We are just human and we just want to exist as humans. And the world does not want to see us live. So here we are (laughs) having to find (laughs) pockets and moments of joy for a lot of pain and sadness, as you said. I'm really looking forward to this book. I was expecting it in my post books, but I think they're waiting to for launch. <laughs> I'm I like, when wait. is it coming? Um, <laughs> I'm really excited about it, especially because I was a fan of the podcast. I'm like, I can't wait to see what Zebra's put together. This is very exciting to me. And I'm so glad we're speaking now because I was like, such a fan. But I don't think you realize how much I loved your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> like, I had so free. Oh my gosh. This is amazing. It was like one of the first five podcasts I've ever listened to. That's when podcasts 
came to the UK. We can only consume American podcasts. There were no black podcasts here. And then I started a network with one where we celebrated diverse creators. So I started a show and then that show inspired other people to start. So we, like I was one of five when I was wow. still listening to your show. And now there's like hundreds, which is great. But it, it was it was really, I don't think you understand how like podcast was such a defining moment, especially for the voices, because you are you had such a strong point of view. And of course, I was listening to the read as well. And I think there was one called Brown Girls Talking, which was mm-hmm. also around at that time. And it was just like, oh my God, look at these women like expressing themselves and just saying what they want to say. And they're swearing. That was such a moment for me. You were a carefree black girl back then. To me, that was what you represented of like, I can do this too. I can be open. I can be vocal. I can say what I want. I can have opinions and my opinions are valid and matter and can be said out loud. I'm just very excited about your book and seeing it come to life and see your words in print, which is very exciting. I love that. I would love to know what joy looks like for you today. What does that feel like? How do you manifest joy in your life, in your day to day? What is it? Today I'm having a really good day, which is rare for me because I'm usually in a bad mood, but I'm in a really good (laughs) mood today. I think joy for me, my home is so important to me. One of the things that gives me joy is definitely having a home that feels like me Mm -hmm. and that's open and bright and that I can just be weird in, (laughs) you know? And I think also joy for me what else does joy look like things like this when we were doing that podcast we thought we were just talking out into nothing like we didn't know what was going on and so anytime I hear that another black woman listens to that podcast or reads my work or follows my mood boards or whatever and is moved in any way by it as corny as it sounds it really is one of the things that keeps me going because it, it means that I'm making some tiny impact on this world and on the healing of Black women. And that is what is most important to me. I love it. That's great. I'm glad I didn't make your day worse. (laughs) And in fact, added something (laughs) to it, added a little bit of joy to it. Can you talk to me about what good looks like for your work and how you know something's finished? What did that feel like? And how did you know? I knew because I had a deadline and I just had to turn it in. There's so many things. I, I recently read the audiobook. And there's so many things that I want to change and that I wish I could change and I wish I could add to. I say all that to say I'm really trying to get to a place where I'm the kind of writer that just knows that I'm never going to be satisfied, but it's not about me. (laughs) You know, it's really not about me and how I feel because I have written things that I thought were absolutely terrible and then have had people email me being like, oh my God, this piece changed my life. So it, it has nothing to do with me. Once the work is out, it exists in the world as its own creature. And like, you just have to witness it, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, because for me, listen, it took me four months to decorate my home. So like, <laughs> you see, like I, I'm, ne- I'm, I'm never satisfied, but I'm working on it. What are you working on improving right now? I'm working on improving my writing. I think there's always room to do different things. I want to write fiction. I like they're just different things I want to do. So definitely want to improve that. And I think I really want to improve my relationship to my body. And that's something I write about in the book. I recently gained quite a bit of weight over the last like two years. And it was such a jarring experience in a lot of ways. I, 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 I didn't realize how much internalized fat phobia I had until I actually became fat and had to reckon with this new body. And it's a journey, but I think that what it's taught me my self-worth cannot be contingent on the way that I look because guess what my body is going to keep changing (laughs) it's going to keep happening gray hair is going to come the you know the the wrinkles are going to come the boobs are going to sag a little bit more the butt it's just (laughs) that is a reality of a body like that's what it, it means to have a body and I think that by improving my relationship I mean by accepting what is right and and accepting that what is is just as precious and beautiful and worthy of existing as what I looked like when I was 21 or 16 or 5 you know yeah. cuz it's we, we change thank you for sharing that because i also gained some weight during this two year whatever the hell this these last two years was <laughs> 
And I definitely, definitely really felt everything you said because I didn't realize how much internalized fat phobia I had. And I thought I was, an, I definitely felt like I was a strong ally and an advocate. I was liking the plus size post. But somewhere in me, I was, well, that will never be me. Mm-hmm. And I had to really reconcile with those thoughts because I'm like, well, this is an extra stone and a bit that I am seeing on the scale. It's not shifting. It's definitely not going the other way. So, but I'm like, I'm also looking at my body. I'm like, but I like it. Like, I don't, I don't hate you. I like, this looks normal. I don't feel abnormal, but the number on the scale, yeah, there's a lot going on. But yes, I think a lot of women are probably suffering in silence about lockdown weight gain and also post 30 weight gain which is a whole other thing mm-hmm. that no one seemed to mention that happens when you're over 30 now oh suddenly things just start staying and sticking <laughs> but we move it looks nice i think you look good i only have one more question to ask and people tend to trip on this so feel free to think about it if it, ta- if it takes you a moment but what is the best advice you've ever received and what's the worst advice you've ever received a lot of i love my my mom but a lot of the advice she's giving me i've just <laughs> <laughs> this is not has like this? good because it's you know because you know being an immigrant the mentality is really just about survival so I understand but you know my mom when I when I was younger she she told me that I should I shouldn't write about race because it would upset white people and I remember getting really pissed off about that and like annoyed by that but not so much at her but at the circumstances that led her to have that opinion and have that fear of what these institutions these white dominated institutions will think and will do if you tell the truth because that's what I do when I write about race I'm not just saying anything I'm telling the truth of what this world is because of white supremacy. And so that was bad advice. And I think the best advice I've received is from my friend Fariha, which is to try to maintain a spiritual practice, especially when you are an artist of any kind and you're public facing in any way, you can get really wrapped up just like the the petty whatever of life, things that don't actually matter. And I think that, yeah, having a spiritual practice has really helped me to just put things in, into perspective and be less afraid because at the end of the day, I say this and like, I feel like I've said this in every interview I've done, but I'm going to say it again. We're all going to die. <laughs> and yes. yeah, we're, we're all going to die. And I just feel like I don't want to spend my life worrying about things that ultimately are not the point of why I'm here. I'm not here to make money. I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to create things that hopefully will help move and heal people. Nice. I love that. It's a link to your purpose and reconnecting with purpose all the time. That's a wonderful way to end. Thank you so much, Ziba. Thank you. This was delightful. I don't know if you noticed, but I was 100% having a moment because Zeba's podcast was literally one of the first five podcasts I ever listened to. And it made me feel like I could take up space in the podcast world. I highly recommend you get her book, Carefree Black Girls, which is a celebration of black womanhood in all its forms. Also, if you like Zeba's vibe, follow her on Twitter at ZBlay. All of those details are in the show notes. As usual, I hope this half an hour has made you think, reflect and contemplate what your next step should be. If you enjoyed this episode, please do share it with your friends or on social media. If you're a podcaster and you think you want to join a community that takes you and your podcast to the next level, go ahead and visit contentisqueen.org where you can access free resources, talks and news as well as join our community. That's contentisqueen.org. That's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye. This is a Content is Queen production, hosted by me, Imriel Morgan, edited by Joseph Perry, sound design by Amber Miller, music and sound effects are from Epidemic Sound. See.